next guest is a Canadian Idol winner, singer, songwriter, and recently he teamed up with another singular sensation guest, Michael Landsberg, with One Last Chance, a documentary about his journey with mental health. And we are so, so grateful to have him join us here today. Please join me in welcoming Theo Tams. Hello. Hey, hey, hey how are you? Thank you for having I'm me. I'm so good. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and chat today. Of course. Now, you and I have quite a few things in common, even though we've never met in person. We are both Canadian reality show survivors. Yes. What were you on? I didn't know this. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's Canada. Um, the difference is you won. Um, <laughs> I did not. So I was on the CBC show, How Do You Solve a Problem Like Maria? Amazing. Um, that's crazy. Yeah. It's, it's my biggest credit. Um, yes. About <laughs> Canada, when your biggest credit is losing a reality show, but but here we are. First of all, one last chance. Like I just want to say thank you for sharing your story and being so open and so vulnerable. Um, I think that there's so much relativity in the story that you share, especially with the artistic community. Um, so thank you for doing that and for sharing with us. It's really special. Wow, thank you. I'm. Uh, I mean, we shot that documentary back in. August of, mm -hmm. of 21 uh, that obviously just came out a couple of weeks ago. So it's kind of been this, uh, this huge wait for the last six months. So I'm really proud of it. I'm proud that it's out. Uh, in some ways, the most beautiful thing about it is that I feel like sometimes when we talk about our mental health and, you know, and trauma that we feel like it's so uniquely ours. And mm -hmm. even though it is our own kind of, you know, lived experience, so it feels so personal and it is in certain aspects but I think what was mind-blowing to me was how many people from all different walks of life from all over the world saw pieces of themselves in in this story in my story and that's mm. uh, that's just something that I, I never expected and it just goes to show that this stigma that still surrounds mental health is so unwarranted because so many of us have had you know, in one way or another, our own battle with it. I'm trying to stay on topic, but I just think it's so interesting what you're saying. When some someone shares something and you see yourself in it, it can completely change the trajectory of, of where you're going and bring new discoveries and awareness that maybe you had no idea was even there. Just something maybe felt off or difficult or, you know, you just talked it up to, oh, I'm being over dramatic and we minimize our own situation. If that makes any sense. Exactly. No, a hundred percent. I think that's uh, that's why, as uncomfortable as it can be sometimes to to open up and to talk about, um, even if we don't, you know, have everything figured out because we never will. I think that it's kind of within that uncomfortability that mm -hmm. there's so much discovery on the other end of it. So I don't think that like being uncomfortable should ever ever stop us shooting this documentary was the most uncomfortable thing I've done in my entire life. And I bet. <laughs> I'm, it also was the most healing thing I've ever done. Mm -hmm. So, you know, on un being uncomfortable should never, should never be the roadblock. Mm -hmm. I have a colleague that I work with that said, just because it doesn't feel good, doesn't mean it's not good work. Yes, exactly. Yeah, right. So Canadian Idol, uh, it's a singing competition, which is hard enough. Being in a competitive field with so many people that are just like you to try and stand out on, you know, a panel's terms, it's stressful enough, mm -hmm. but you're also on television and they like to dig in and create that narrative for you. I was the girl who cried. Um, <laughs> so, and on top of that, you were on your own journey as well. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot to contend with as well. So like, what kind of impact did your Canadian Idol experience have on you as a person, as well as a performer? I've, I've always said, and you know from being on a show like that, that career-wise, professionally, it's a very double-edged sword. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that show was 13 years ago, and I've been grinding and hustling ever since. And there is still people in the industry who I have to convince almost on a daily basis that I'm not just some kid from Canadian Idol. Um, so there's, there's an element of frustration there, but for me, um, I mean, I feel like I've been in the business of proving people wrong since the day I was born. Mm -hmm. So I'm okay with that. Uh, I use it as motivation, but personally, I feel like that show 
and part of my motivation for going on it in the first place um, was nothing to do with music and nothing to do with singing. I really kind of saw my participation on that show as an escape route, mm -hmm. just getting me out of Southern Alberta, which for me at the time was a super, super toxic environment. I was still kind of in the closet, one foot out of the closet, but I didn't have the support from family or friends. I grew up in a very strict kind of Christian environment. So uh, even high school, I went to a Christian high school. My first year of university, I went to Christian university. So I just knew that I needed out. And I kind of thought to myself, even if I can hit the top 10 of a show like Idol, hopefully make enough connections to just get me out. So that was always kind of the driving motivator was to just mm -hmm. make it as far as you can so that you can get out of Southern Alberta. I never expected to win. I never expected to ever make it as far as I did. Yeah, let alone win. So it was, it was, it was wild. I love that Canadian Idol was your exit strategy. <laughs> yeah, it really, it really, it really was. It sounds awful to say, but it's amazing what we'll find to use as a resource when we feel like we don't have the support needed. Like we will grasp at the most random straws, you know, for me, so much as trying to utilize a national TV show just to get out. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I will always be extremely thankful for my participation on that show simply for that reason, because it was the most transformative period of my life other than sobriety. Mm -hmm. um, so and it kind of, you know, I was so blessed to be around super liberal, progressive people who kind of gave me that community that I didn't have, but that I was desperately needing in those moments. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it was a, it was a great thing that way. I can really appreciate you saying that because it is important to, to have that, that safety, because if not, you end up creating sort of a false narrative for yourself, which, which leads to, you know, to tricky places and trying to kind of mask and fit into something where you just, you just don't. You know, even just when we were shooting the doc and kind of going back and looking at that footage, I was just like, it's, it's just like this universe moment, like this serendipity that it happened the way that it did. Um, but it's so crazy because I ended up posting that teaser, that clip specifically of coming out on Idol um, on TikTok and it ended up going viral. I think oh, it was wow. at, I think it was at like a million views or a million and a half views within a couple days. Wow. And what was so interesting was all of these young kids, the demographic of TikTok, you know, the 15, 16, 17 year olds were all commenting being like, what, what's the issue here though? Like he just said, like, why did people care? Why did the show care? Like something's not adding up here. And it's so interesting to me that I'm like, I love that. I love that they were so confused by it because I'm like, look how far we've come in 13 years. It's, it's really, it's a beautiful thing to see just how the kids nowadays who are out and proud and they can't even conceptualize how mm -hmm. it wouldn't be that way. What made you want to share your story? I think why I chose to fully go there was, like I said, one, because it's such a privilege, I think, to be able to share your story. And two, the amount of healing that I knew was going to be on the other side um, was still something that is just mind blowing to me. You know, I'm, I just feel so lucky because in so many ways, I feel like that documentary was able to finally, uh, bring a little bit of closure to a few different aspects of just pain talking about uh mental health and you know specifically for me anxiety and depression was something that I've always felt quite comfortable to do um what I wasn't expecting um and it just is such a testament to Michael specifically but also Corey just the safe space that they, cre they created um like I said, we were meant to talk for half an hour, 45 minutes maybe. And I think we, we talked for almost three hours. I had no intention of, of talking about, uh, you know, being suicidal at such a young age. I had no intention of talking about the sexual abuse that occurred when I was a kid. Um, these were all things that just in the moment, I kind of 
I've, I truly felt that if I'm, if I'm being blessed with the privilege and the opportunity given this platform to tell my story, then I think it would be a disservice to not tell the full story. I think that's so great that you were so open with, with your, you know, the company you're working with and sharing, because I think having a dialogue like that, I was talking to a friend about, she was in a moment and had an audition and was like, I don't know if I can do it. I said, talk to your agent and start that conversation so that they can support you in what you need and they can know what your needs are. Because I think we're in a place right now where we're able to vocalize that need because mental illness is like anything else, a flu, a broken bone, it needs, Mm -hmm. it needs care. It's just, it's not tangible, you know? And I think doing it at three months sober, I think that that says a lot about your dedication to sobriety because that is really early. Um, yeah, that's know. when we, that's when we originally started the conversation. I think when I, when, when, we, when we shot the doc, I think it was about seven, eight months, mm-hmm. um, which is still super, super early. And I've heard from people within, uh, the sober community who have said, uh, you know, that I probably would have had more of a bearing and be able to offer more advice. Um, if I was a little bit further along in my sobriety journey before shooting that documentary. Um, But I mean, I said from the very beginning, I'm not a poster child for sobriety. I'm not Mm -hmm. a poster child for mental health. Mm -hmm. What I am a poster child for, if I had to be one, is to just tell your story. You cannot, don't sit in silence with it anymore because there's so much freedom from just telling it. And always remember that your truth is not debatable. People mm-hmm. can make it seem like it is. People can make it seem like your struggles with mental health or your journey into sobriety is up for debate and it's not. It's mm-hmm. your life and your truth. And that the truth is never up for debate. I love that. I love that. Yeah, I've never actually spoken about about my sobriety, which we're we're doing right now. Here we are. So I've been sober for just over a year. It's been about a year and three months. Um, And, and I think no matter what your time is, your experience is your experience. And there's going to be someone that will identify with your experience. And I can say for me, my sobriety was a huge catalyst in maintaining and finally doing that work with my own mental health, because I was not running anymore. And I when Mm -hmm. I look back, and I think the pandemic has been really good for that, I needed to be pulled out of my life as mm-hmm. it was before, because I was, I was hiding in my work and I was numbing how I felt. I have, you know, and I've since been reassessed and re-diagnosed with anxiety, but social anxiety. And I was like, social anxiety, me? And then I look right. back and go, yeah, yeah, that checks out. That checks out. And this kind of actually leads into my next question. Cause I found, I felt so anxious being on stage, being in front of people. I finally faced it. Cause I've been so scared of being like, I know once I open that closet, I'm going to get buried in whatever is in there and I'm going to have to dig myself. I don't want, no, thank you. Buy me a bottle of wine. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. yeah. But since then I've, yeah. I've, I've been able to, to look at that and get my diagnosis. I was diagnosed with ADHD recently, which has brought up a whole clarity. So I feel like on this side of it, it's about sharing your experience. And for me, it's been able to open that space of okay what's really going on and through that journey like I've been able to really sort of feel like I've met myself my real self that I've just been Mm -hmm. sort of too afraid to to show and you're talking about anxiety and depression very familiar nice to meet you um I feel like mental illness and addiction are often linked like what I was just saying you know, we're so expected to be on and to always be pitching ourselves, always be promoting ourselves and always be presenting ourselves in this perfect light that we're marketable and that we're this and that. And, and that is anxiety inducing. And so to deal with the anxiety, we look for different ways to work through it. So for you, was there a link between, do you think you're the anxiety and the, the career and the, the, you know, substance, like what was the connection for you if there was one? I think, you know, alcohol was always my number one. Uh, But I found myself, I wasn't just numbing bad feelings, you know, like pain and anger and resentment and sadness and all these things that people think that's why people use 
use drugs or drink too much or whatever, you know, for me, it was also, I was doing it on the other end too. Like if I was really excited or if I was really happy, I, I also couldn't, I didn't know how to also live with those, those feelings. So yeah. I would drink to dull those as well. So drinking really became my coping mechanism after I had won the show. I would say the first couple of years after the show was when it just, it really slid into, you know, daily drinking. Um, and, you know, I feel like we always have this, this checklist of things that we say, as long as we don't do that, we don't have a problem, you know, as long as mm -hmm. I don't drink in the morning or as long as I'm not drinking every day or all these things. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, my list probably started with 20, 25 things. And by the time I finally decided enough was enough, I think there was one still left on the list, you know? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so drinking had become my coping mechanism. I didn't know how to handle pressure. I didn't know how to go from being on the biggest stage in the country with that winning moment to two months later being like, what am I doing? So um, drinking quickly became uh, my support system. It was my best friend. It was my teacher. It was the answer to every question. Um, it was, it, it was my, it was my life. And it literally wasn't until, well, it's interesting that you say that you're thankful for the pandemic because as awful as it is to say, I'm, I'm so thankful for it too. I think it, it saved my life. I, don't, I honestly think that if COVID was not a thing, I think I would be dead or very close to it. So I've said the same I am, thing. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's so scary to think. Um, so it's interesting now kind of being on the other side of it or, or working my way through it, mm -hmm. feeling the full spectrum of human emotion again. It's, uh, it's wild. <laughs> like, yeah. Life is wild when you're sober. What what might be something you'd like to share with with other performers who may be who may be struggling right now? The biggest takeaway is that um, no matter how suffocated you feel, no matter how much you feel like you are drowning in life right now, no matter how far you have slipped or spiraled out of control, whether that's mental health or addiction. Um, your past is not a life sentence. You know, you can have a drastically different life tomorrow from, or now, next moment from small decisions. And it's often the smallest decision uh, that can have the largest um, impact. And I, I just challenge every single artistic person, regardless of what your medium is, to try to use peace and try mm -hmm. to use contentment as inspiration. Um, and I feel like the more that we allow moments of it, you'll realize that that negative stuff that we hold so close to ourselves, because it's almost like we've been trained as artists that we need this type of chaotic, you know, pain and darkness all the time. In other words, we're not true artists. Mm -hmm. um, the more you're going to realize that the strength of your art is going to be there, whether you are happy and at peace, as well as when you're going through those times, because whether you cling to them or not, you're still going to have them, you know? So I think it's just allow yourself to be inspired by um, just the simple, simple beauty of contentment too. Hmm. I love that. Theo, thank you so much for taking time to chat with us today. Thank you can you. learn more about Theo and his music and all of the things at theotamsmusic.com and the documentary One Last Chance. Thank you again for sharing your story through that documentary and for chatting with us today. It was such a pleasure. Thank you.